<laughs> oh, dear old Lawrence and Philippa and team here, great to be back with you again. How are you? You all good? Someone sitting beside someone attractive this morning? Put your hand up if you're sitting beside someone attractive. <laughs> we can wait. We can wait. Yeah, come on, you guys. That's it. That's it. It's awesome. That's right, yeah. It's, I say that sometimes and people, look, you go to some churches and look like they've been baptised in lemon juice, you know. And uh, I say, come on, all the ugly people then, put your hands up. You know, that, you don't have to do that this morning, so that's good. So uh, there we go. Hey, listen, I, just before we get cracking, um, and what a great, I love that. I love atmosphere. Um, you know, you could just just you come into places and go into shops and you go, what's going on in here? And my friend, my old friend Marcus Arden, anybody remember that name? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, Marcus used to say, that's why people burn incense in some shops because it uh, demons smell. <laughs> I went, really? Is that a thing? Uh, oh, my time's up. <laughs> so, that's not. Oh, that was it. <laughs> and, um, and so every time I go into to some shops and that, I go, I'm not sniffing out uh, things, but um, I'm aware, um, you know, and aware of the presence of God and, and all of those kind of things. And I, uh, one of the great things I try to do um, when, I'm, when I'm ministering um, is, is just help to have that kind of awareness that's going on. Some people are aware of all kinds of things, but never aware of the presence of God. You know, if you're ticked off with someone in this place right now, or you don't like them, or, um, you know, you've fallen out with them, which happens apparently in churches. It's crazy. Um, it happens at, at workplaces. It happens in politics. It happens... Hey, Lawrence. And, um, and uh, he's the acting mayor at the moment. It's quite, ex- it's quite exciting, eh? If there's an emergency, he has to push the big red button, <laughs> eh? So I don't know. That's quite exciting. So just pray there's not an emergency while we're here because he's just acting as a mayor. So it's, just, it's more theatrical than political, you know what I'm saying? So... Yeah. <laughs> Lawrence and I have known each other for a long, long time. Honey, would you come and join me for a minute? Honey's my, this is, this is Honey. Uh, honey is my first wife, and um, we met when we were 17. Yeah. Louis, 17. Dar was wearing this mini skirt. Oh, no, you haven't talked about that. <laughs> Who's ever heard the mini skirt story before? Yeah, come on. Well, this is the gal that was wearing it. Long legs and a wide belt, you know, like, and so that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. I fell in lust. Love, love. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, um, we got, we, we met when we were 17, uh, married when we were 20. And we celebrated uh, last weekend. We were both we both turned seventy, so there's only two days difference. She's old. Older. She's older. Oh. <laughs> I like older women. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so that that was really cool. We're forty years in ministry, haven't we? And we're in our fiftieth year of marriage. So there we go. So. <laughs> So I get said to Dale, you've got to say hi, because I've always said, you know, you've got to meet Dale. If you haven't met Dale, she's just the best. She really is. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your lovely welcome. It's such a pleasure to be here. Ian comes and regales me with stories every time he's here, and I felt like, oh, it's so nice to be here with him and, and just kind of, you know, bring the other side to the story. How many, you know, there's always two sides to a story. Well, if you want to know the other side, just ask me later. <laughs> But just as we're just enjoying the presence of God, I just want to say, um, just can I add to, honey, your uh, little um, core roar um, before about the presence of God. You know, we can come, and yours too, um, we can come when we're feeling up and we feel very aware of the presence of God. And, and you know, if we feel like we've done a good job or everything's going fine, uh, whatever, Uh, we feel more confident coming into the presence of God. But God is just an invitation. You know, if you're feeling bitter, come. If you're feeling angry, you might be angry at God. You know, he's he's so welcoming of you. Just come. You might feel full of regrets here this morning. You might think, oh, if only I hadn't done that. I shouldn't have done that. I should have said that. I mean, we've all had times when we've done things. You thought, oops, I got that wrong. You know, if you're feeling like that this morning and don't feel like you're qualified to come into the awareness of the presence of God, God's saying, come, come, come. Bring your stuff. 
bring your stuff for me. I want you to bring it. I know it's there. Come on, we try and hide it. We put on this religious picture. You know, we try and look like we've got it all together, but inside, none of us have. Welcome to humanity. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. And he knows what's happening on inside anyway, because he lives in us. <laughs> we can't really hide anything, can we? But he's just saying, come, come into that awareness of your presence and give it to me. Give it to me if you're weary and heavy laden. Come and give me the, and I'll give you rest. Give me that bitterness, that resentment. Let it go. You know, if I give something to Ian, you know, he's got to actually take it and receive it. You know, but if he's trying to hang, like if you're trying to hang on to your worry and get rest at the same time, it doesn't work. Right. It's worry or rest. You know, what do you want? Yeah. You can't hang on to your stuff and get it from God. And I, I believe this morning that God's saying, give me your stuff. I want to give you rest. I want to give you hope. I want to give you purpose. I want to give you confidence. I want that anxiety. You're not built to carry that. You're not meant to carry that. Your body doesn't cope well with it. Give it to me, and I'll give you rest, what you need and what you long for. And there's freedom here for you this morning. There is freedom for every one of you, but you've got to hand over what it is that you're carrying, whether it be regret or bitterness or anger. You might be angry at God. We've all had times when we felt God's let us down. Hand it over and see what he will do. And it's just very simple. Just, okay, God, just become aware. He's as close as your next breath. Come here. Okay, God, I'm really angry or bitter or resentful or frightened. Whatever it is, we all have stuff. And I choose to give it to you. What will you give me in exchange it's always about exchange. Prayer is about always about exchange. It's always an exchange upwards. And God wants to exchange stuff for you this morning. He's got stuff for you, freedom for you, liberty for you, joy for you that you thought was out of your reach. He's got it for you this morning, and he wants to give it to you. Don't let the enemy steal it from you. Because he will if he can. Bless you. Yeah, come on. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And tonight when we, um, we have our encounter service, you know, we'll just continue to share in that vein, but also to pray for you and pray with you and all of those kind of things, just lay hands on. In fact, I want to speak about that for the next few moments, just the whole area of impartation. But that awareness of God that we're speaking of is just so, so important. Um, as I said before, some of us can be ticked off with people, you know, and we know where they're sitting right now, even though you're looking at me and you're, some of you are smiling at me and all of that kind of stuff, and that's great. But there's an awareness that there is someone in the room that you're just not right with. Now, I, I can say this in any church, in any situation, in any school, any teaching environment, anything. Generally, all of those, those things happen because we're humans and we, we, we just have, we think differently, we, we have different opinions, we have different outlooks, all of those kind of things. But if we're aware of that, then how much more should we be aware of the presence of God? You know, if we're aware of our anger or our disappointment or our, all of those kind of things. And so it's just like, oh, no, why don't we just drop into the awareness of God? And, um, and so you drop down, and the old Quakers used to say, an old revivalist used to drop down into their spirit, where, where is God living? You know, so, I mean, I've been to those church prayer meetings. I guarantee you have too. You know, you're trying to haul God down into your meeting. Oh, God will be good for a few minutes if you just come and bless us, you know. And uh, it's like, what? You know, it's like, you know, and we're like, oh, if you just come, you know, and I, I'm sitting in those meetings going, he's already here. What are you doing? You know, like, let's start with the fact that he's present. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And, and he's not sort of kind of standing off from you. He lives where? In us. You know, Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's, that's what Colossians says, 126. You know, that, that, that Paul says, this is the secret. Christ lives in you. It's amazing, you know, like, and, and here we are trying to get him in, and he's already going, hey, I'm here. 
and uh, he wants to speak to us, he wants to bring revelation to us, he wants us to learn to be aware of us. So that's part of the stuff that Dale and I do all the time, just helping people in their awareness of God. And, um, and, uh, and we love that. So I want you to turn that on this morning a little bit, because we can turn it off really well. It's like trying to find the station on an old radio, you know, like... <clears throat> anyway, radios, we used to have radios. <laughs> wireless, the wireless, you know. Uh, yeah, how to take them back? Yeah, all of that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, just tuning in on all of that. However, I just want to be able to just uh, talk a little bit about impartation this morning, all right? Is that okay? So impartation is, is uh, and I, I was going to do something else, and I just felt the Lord speak to me. He said there's, a, there, there's just a, um, uh, to give uh, fresh understanding, maybe some teaching. Uh, I, I don't classify myself as a teacher. I'm an imparter. And, uh, and so, uh, and uh, faith comes when, when I speak, people get saved, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it, it happens afterwards. I only hear about it years later sometimes. So if that's you today, please tell me while I'm still alive, that would be really helpful um, because, you know, I just go, I could, we can celebrate together. Yeah. Uh, we had a young fellow contact us just a week ago. He was in our church probably over 20 years ago. Um, in Invercargill. I can't remember him, Dale can, um, and he got told off by one of our pastors and turned away from the Lord. You know, he got embittered. And uh, I didn't know any of this until kind of a week ago. He lives in Wellington now. He lost a marriage. Um, he's, um, he's remarried. He got a couple of weak kids and uh, all of those kind of things. And he was deeply into the occult, all right? So he went from, you know, really being a believer, writing a Christmas program and all that kind of things. And um, because he said some things in it that he was trying to reach the unsaved, you know, one of the pastors... Um, you know, said, you know, that's just uh, occultic stuff and all that kind of, just completely turned them off. And, uh, you know, you have to disciple people. Yeah. I'll try this side over here. <laughs> you have to disciple people, you know, you just have to bring them in. Yeah, see, they're way more holy. And, uh, they go, <laughs> and you just have to lead them on and say, hey, no, no, come on, let, let's just work with you and all of those kind of things. Um, and so anyway, he is, he's just completely messed up. He's got into all kinds of stuff, drugs, the whole, whole deal, completely lost. And he's walking along Cuba Street a few weeks ago. And um, he, he was just, you know, in an incredibly dark place. And he sees this man leading his little boy along Cuba Street. And he's watching him because he's got his hands on his shoulders and he's just guiding him along the street. And he realized the little boy was blind. And uh, his father's talking to him constantly, but leading him, helping him to make his own decisions, all of those kind of things as he's going along. And just loving him. He's going to, he's bending down and whispering in his ear, and, and you can see the affection on it. And he said, I saw that, and suddenly, out of nowhere, God imparted something to me that I was not looking for. And he said, I began to cry. And he said, Here I am in the middle of Cuba Street. I start sobbing uncontrollably. And it took me two weeks to stop. And he reached out and contacted us. And he said, what do I do with this now? And I talked to him on the phone. And I said, isn't God so incredibly amazing that he would manifest himself as a father in, in the way that you're wired up? Incredibly visual guy. Incredibly artistic. Incredibly, you know, uh, you know feeling orientated people. And suddenly he sees a father leading a blind boy along the road. And he said, who are you in the story? Who are you in the story? And, you know, he, he just, you could hear him on the phone again, just under a week, and he realized, and he's just come back to God at 100 miles an hour. And uh, he's looking for a church. I've tried to hook him up with a couple of churches, and I, I need to check on how he's going with all of that kind of thing. But it's not just church. It's the relationship with the father. It's a relationship going in our blindness. You know, all of us have been like that. You know, we're you know, eyes wide open but blind in some of the things that we, that, that we do. And, and then we reap the consequences of those things. And, uh, and, and so I'm just wanting to encourage you this morning. Come on, let's see the Father guiding us, speaking to us. He's always speaking to us. You know, but our radio, you know, there's like in, in this room right now, there's radio, television wave, short wave, long wave, you know, tidal wave. I don't know. They're all in here. <laughs> it's just like in the, in the realm of the spirit, uh, in, in the realm of the, of the not just supernatural, but just, you know, electronics just, just bathing us and 
gamma rays or whatever they are, <laughs> X-rays, like, like your brain's being, like, anyway, don't, <laughs> let's not go there. And, um, but, and all of that, but if you've, you know, we, we're oblivious to them, except if we have a receiver. And so we, you know, if we turn on our, our radio, if we turn on our phone, if we turn on those things, we can receive the information. And that's exactly the same as how we, we, we operate in, our, in, our, in, our, in, our, in ourselves. So we tune in. Like, God, where are you at the moment? Where is your presence? What's happening right now? And I, I just need to know your impartation, your, your, your awareness of you. And um, Lord, I just want you to bow your head for it. Well, not bow your head, just close your eyes if you wish. Um, but, um, you know, be, become aware of your presence right now. Tangible, that the presence of God is here. The opening you know, Messianic Jews would, would, would say the Lord's Prayer uh, and they would say, uh, Our Father, not only is, it, is he in heaven, because heaven, let me look, look at me for a while, where is heaven? So up there somewhere. Which, how far up? Well, you know, the second and third heavens and we've heard all kinds of different teaching about how far away. But God is far away. No, he's not. And they pray this. This is their interpretation of the Lord's Prayer. Um, our Father who is in the very air that we breathe. All right. And so, you know, and God breathed into his creation. You know, he brought breath. Uh, and we live in a beautiful nation. We understand hongi. We understand the pressing of noses, the exchange of breath. We know uh, because it's a demonstration of life again. And God has breathed into us. It's like that young man in Cuba Mall. He said, what can I use to breathe in him again? And, and let him be resuscitated again. Let him know me again, uh, to refresh me again. And he used something to break past every barrier that he had put up. And so we become aware of the presence of God. We become aware, you know, we're often aware of our own failures, frustrations, sin, uh, falling short of the mark. We, we often, you know, of, of failure, of, of whatever. We, we're very aware of those things. But we're aware right now, Lord, of your presence. Mm. Thank you, Lord. We're aware of your presence. And we thank you for your presence, your nearness, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Maybe like that young man, you were hurt in some way. Uh, someone said something, you've festered over that for, for months, years, weeks, maybe even just a couple of days. But right now, Father, we thank you that your goodness, your graciousness is so much more than our reactions. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You know what impartation is? This it's impartation is an ex, is a not an exchange, but it's a it's a gift um, from a store or a storehouse. Uh, I run a conference in the South Island called Boutique, and um, it's um, you know it sounds like a, a shopping trip because it's in Queenstown. It is, um, but um, it, it's a, it's a great place. But the but it comes from a French word, and the foundation of that is storehouse. So a boutique is a, is a storehouse, and I often think of the fact that when leaders come to that conference, they're being imparted from a storehouse that God has provided to begin to bring strength and to bring in wholeness and liberty and refreshment into their lives. And people look forward to going to that conference because that's exactly what it's become. It's an outpouring. And, uh, and so we're doing that again next year, and that's, that's exciting and all of that. So those uh, kind of things are there. Now, um, just you think, I'm, don't, so you don't think I'm unsaved, I have a scripture um, here, so I want to read that out to you. If you've got Bibles, I don't, I don't know whether it'll be on the screen because I haven't given the guys any feed up, but it's Hebrews 6, reading out of the um, uh, New Living Translation, Hebrews 6, um, and it's just five verses. It says, let's stop going over the basic teachings of Christ again and again. Let us go on instead to become mature in our understanding. In other words, God wants us to grow up, all right? He wants, us to, he wants us to progress from strength to strength, all of those kind of things. And, um, and so let us go on again and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting uh, from evil deeds, uh, from placing our faith in God. Um, and uh, and you, you don't need further instruction about baptism or the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead or internal judgment. Uh, and so, God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. Now, I, I don't know about you, but there's not many Christians that go past this place. Uh, you know, these are the basic things. Repentance, 
You know, repentance is just changing our mind. That's all it is. The Greek word is metanoia, and it just means to change our mind. It's to go, I'm going in one direction, and it's like the young man in Cuba Mall and I, and has an encounter, and then he chooses to go in another direction. And his language, you can hear him. He's so excited. He's, he, he's going, I need to get, find fellowship. I need to find fellowship. And you know, this is the kind of fellowship he's looking for. Where can I find fellowship that has got the saturated with the presence of God? Because he, that's what happened to him. After you've been crying for um, two weeks, generally, you, you <laughs> it's what's called an emotional wreck, you know. And, and then somebody goes, I, but in the midst of all of that, it, it's just a crazy impartation. I'm going, I want more. Yes, I'm wrung out, but I, I, there's, a, there's just a deep hunger uh, in you for that. Uh, the week before I met Dale, I, I, met a, I met a man called Murray Thompson. He was a Maori evangelist in, in New Zealand and not well known. But he carried something that I didn't know about. And I went, I was, um, I was, uh, I'd given my heart to Jesus when I was 11. Some of you may have heard the story, but um, I'll just repeat it quickly. Uh, and, and I, but I'd got into, um, you know, I had one foot in the church and one foot in the world. And I was stepping more and more into the world. And, uh, and so uh, I knew how to be a Christian and act like one, but I also knew how to be a pagan and act like one. And uh, anybody? No one. Oh, that's amazing. I'm definitely in the wrong house. And, um, <laughs> and so, you know, we just kind of like do all those kind of things. And um, but anyway, I got invited. I was doing martial arts at the time. And um, in the gym I was at, the Youth for Christ ran a meal up above uh, where we were in the gymnasium, uh, where we practiced. And, uh, and so one of the guys there, his name's Russell Dunn, um, he runs Mana Stores, or used to, throughout New Zealand. And uh, he started uh, Mana years ago uh, with his family and, um, and retired now and all that kind of stuff. But he asked me, would I like to come to a house party? And uh, so a uh, house party for me was just a party in a house. But for him, it was, um, it was, uh, it was a camp. And so we went to the, this camp the following weekend, and uh, Mary Thompson was a speaker at it. So I turned into Christian mode um, because I recognized that all the people around me were Christians. And, um, and so I just blended into the, into the, into the surroundings. And then Murray spoke. Well, I, don't ask me what he spoke about. I've only heard him speak twice. And that first time, I just went straight over my head. But when I woke up in the morning and I got out of bed, which was on a top bunk, I jumped on the floor. The moment my feet hit the floor, I was radically, like radically transformed. And I suddenly started sharing the gospel with all of the Christians. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and they were like, you know, what, what happened to you? And, uh, and so, but I didn't realize I was doing that. It just seemed so natural to me. It seemed that God had revolutionized me supernaturally. And the presence of God had flowed through me, taken what I knew, and suddenly had polished it up. And I was delivering it out to the point where I went to work the next day. Two days into work, I had a huge stock agent come up to me, grab me by the throat, push me up against a wall, and remember, I was doing competitive martial arts at the time. I thought, and I laughed at him. You know, like, I've got, oh my goodness. And he goes, stop talking about Jesus. <laughs> and I went, I'm not talking about Jesus. And, and, but it was, it was leaking out of me. You know, and within a very short time, I was working with two guys. Both of them I led to the Lord. Uh, all of that kind of stuff was happening like that. I, a, week, a week after that, that was that week, on the Sunday, my father said, you can't stay in our church because... He said, you would be the youth group. I was the only young person uh, in, the, in the entire church. All the rest were old people. And, um, and so I, I went to a Baptist church. Uh, I was my first day there. And in walks Dale. That was first day there for her as well. Our eyes met across a crowded room. Uh, and um, the rest is kind of history. So uh, that, was, that was awesome. A great day. But, you know, God just radically transformed uh, that Now, Dale, I was not a Pentecostal, but Dale led me into the things of the Spirit. And, uh, and so I became hungry and angry about all that kind of stuff. But God led me on a, like a breadcrumb trail to the point where I got filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues. First person I ever heard speak in tongues, as many as you know, was myself. You know, I, I didn't, it took them an hour and a half to shut me up. And, um, you know, I was like a Russian seaman on speed. And it was just like crazy. It was just like different languages, all that kind of stuff. So it was this overflow of all that. It's impartation. 
God took a gift from the, 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 the storehouse and he imparted it to me and it imparted it to me when I wasn't even asking for it. And many times, you know, sometimes when you're just under the preaching of the word, if you're under some of the, uh, under the influence of, um, of so just even reading that scripture, if you could put it up again, that would, that would be brilliant. Look at, these are the fundamental things that were taught to believers. Repentance, so just changing our mind about the way we live. Just, and, and that's all it is. You know, repentance is not, oh God, you know, <laughs> Yeah, you know, just like, I don't know whether you repent like that, possibly. <laughs> possibly. You might be like Kiwis, you know, like, you know, just pretty like, you know, like no emotion. I've repented. Thank you very much. All right, fair enough. And um, <laughs> you should tell your face because <laughs> you're not going to share the gospel with anybody with a face like a washboard, you know, like washboard. Anybody remember a washboard? <laughs> See? Uh, I'm I'm getting too old for those illustrations like that anymore. But anyway, they're just like you know, so yeah, all of that kind of stuff. So repentance, that's like basically one of the things that we do. Not we do. Oh yeah, I know I repented 20 years ago. I'm a much better person now. No, you're not. I could ask your wife. You're just a pain in the neck. You know, like it's a constant, sometimes daily. You know, sometimes um, you know, a, a moment where you just say, God, I'm not going to I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not, I cannot do this anymore. Um, and I was a chain smoker, um, you know, as an as a evangelical, because uh, Spurgeon smoked. Most of the guys in our church smoked. So I watched them smoke, you know, all that kind of stuff. They were on fire for God. And um, the... the <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so it's like... Yeah. Are you there? Yeah, that's right, yeah. And so, um, and, um, and I started smoking when I was a young fellow, 14, I think. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I became immediately addicted. And so, uh, at my heyday, I could do four, a couple of packets a day. So, I mean, they're only 20 cents then, a packet, 20 cents. Hey? So, all you smokers out there, eh? 20 cents, remember that? <laughs> <laughs> I asked the other day at the supermarket, they were 40 bucks. Are you serious? Like, I'm glad I gave up. <laughs> but I, I, the, the, the problem was, in all of that, um, I, uh, you know, I just couldn't, when I became a Christian, leading people to Christ, all those kind of things, I couldn't give up. I was completely addicted to that. So there had to be a point where I came and says, I have to make a decision. I can't do this anymore. But I couldn't, I could, I, whilst I could make the decision, I couldn't give up. And, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd buy a packet of smokes, have one, repent, screw them up, throw them in the bin, go out an hour later to the shop and buy another packet. And, and it would be horrible. Uh, the staff I work with chopped my cigarettes in half because they knew I was trying to give up. They said if you had half a cigarette, you'd be right. So they put them through a guillotine, you know, like that. And that, makes me, that made me angry. Um, and so uh, you, all of these kind of things happen. But when I met Marcus Arden, Marcus said to me, God's got a call on your life. Why aren't you following him? Because I was really passionate about that. I said, Marcus, I can't. I smoke. He goes, what do, you, what do you mean? Why is that holding you up? I go, oh, disgust. <laughs> he said, and, and he said, your, your problem's not smoking. And I said, well, what is my problem? He said, your problem's rebellion. And, I, and immediately God took me back to why I started smoking, because I was wanted to rebel against uh, the ethics of my, my parents and my lifestyle, and that we brought up. And that, for me, was a symbol that I didn't care. And even though my father had smoked for many years but killed him, I've outlived my father. Um, and all of those kind of things. I, I wanted somehow to rebel in, a, in, a, in an area of Christianity that was very legalistic. And so I did that. And the moment I repented, the moment he prayed for me, for that I was completely set free, never had another cigarette. And that was, you've got to know, that was a major miracle for me because I never thought I would, I would be that free. Um, and, um, and all those kind of things. So repentance is, is all of that. Then it goes on about placing our faith in God and using faith. Sometimes we just have to step out and, and, and all of that. But the thing I really wanted to emphasize today, and just in the short time that we've got, uh, is that whole area uh, of baptisms and also the laying on of hands. Now, baptisms are important. I mean, I, when I got saved as an 11-year-old, I got baptized the next weekend. We were talking about this last night. And no one asked me. That was just part of the deal. 
you know, so nowadays you have to pray about it for 30 years. And, um, and uh, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, oh, will I or won't I or, you know, you know, what's the matter? But, you know, the Bible's pretty clear about all of that kind of stuff too. If you're saved, get baptised, you know, because it's a public declaration of your faith. And so, and many Jewish people get baptised many, many times. Every time God gives them an encounter, uh, and uh, Messianic Jews particularly, Jews that know Jesus as Saviour, and... Um, and, and uh, <clears throat> Uh, they they suddenly have a revelation of who he is, and they go, "I'm going to get baptized again." So many will have seven or eight or nine baptisms in their in their life because they're celebrating the fact that they have a new upgrade of theology, if you like, or an upgrade of the presence of God. So that's just a, a by the by for you that some cultures be that, and um, and so uh, that that was that part of that. But here's the point I want to make today: is laying on of hands because we're going to be doing this tonight. All right, the laying on of hands is part of this whole area, and it's such an amazing uh, culture. In uh, First Samuel, Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it over uh, Saul's head. He kissed Saul, and he said, "I'm doing this because the Lord has appointed you as a ruler over Israel." So here, uh, King Saul was being appointed uh, as king. Uh, one of the first kings that Israel had, and um, and Samuel pours oil over him, and uh, and so that's the anointing of oil. But he also laid hands on him at the time as he did that, and uh, so you have incidents of this going right through. Moses appointed leaders, he and he said this in. Um, in, uh, in Numbers 11, he said, I, I will take some of the spirit that is upon you and I will put that same spirit upon you. All right, so he was transferring, if you like, what he was carrying. So what I have, I give to you, all right? That kind of stuff. He was, he was saying, you know, you, and, and I've looked at people and go, I want what you've got. I'll try this side. <laughs> I, I, you know, I see someone praying for the sick. And, uh, and, and I see people getting well. And in the last four or five years, particularly, even with COVID going on, I've seen more healings and more deliverances than I've seen in 40 years of ministry. It's crazy. There's an, uh, there's an upgrade that's coming here in New Zealand. Um, I, I was in the States just three, four weeks ago, and um, I, I met um, a prophetic guy called Chuck Pierce. And Chuck um, just said to me, he said, I absolutely love New Zealand. Something is on New Zealand. And then he still laid hands on me and started prophesying revival to New Zealand. Yeah. And, um, and I took all of that because I'm a revivalist. You know, and I, I, I love talking about revival. But God wants to, he's doing that already. It's a little church up in Kaiwaka, way up in uh, uh, far north. And the people are traveling for hours to get there or, or go the next day to get up there to camp. And, um, and it's places jammed. And uh, there's, there's, there's worship going on. It starts at like 10 or 9 in the morning, finishes whenever the food runs out, um, you know, 6, 7 o'clock at night. People are getting saved, worshiping. That's that, places like that. Place I went to in Christchurch. Wednesday night meeting I did, 400 people in there, people getting saved, people manifesting demons, uh, all those kind of things were happening, people getting set free, we had people walk into the church because they heard the music on the night I was there, they got saved, gave their hearts to Jesus, all of that kind of stuff, they're having gang weddings, um, you know, they said we just want to use a wee room in your church to get married because, you know, we've become Christians and we've got we've got associations, they were, they, they, in fact, one of the biggest white uh, drug dealers families in the Christchurch area, uh, well known, and, um, and the key person in that gang had just got, uh, wanted to get married and gave her heart to Christ, and another guy from an associate as well, he gave his heart to Christ, they've been radically changed, and, uh, and so the church says, no, we don't want you being married in a room, we want to open our church to you, invite all your friends, invite all the, all the members that you want to invite, we will provide the food for you, um, and uh, they'll put balloons, and so they did the whole church up, uh, do that thing, and they invited these things along, and uh, then they just laid hands on them all and prayed for them, and, and, and that was led by the bride and the groom. Yeah, come on, someone, because that's happening in New Zealand. That's happening in New Zealand. And, and why shouldn't it happen in New Zealand? You know, I'm friend with a guy called Lucky Tokoha. Some of you might have met Lucky. And I'm like, amazing guy, you know. Like he's been around our house and, and um, we have, uh, you know, meals and all that kind of stuff. And some of his guys, and he's hilarious because the first prison he was ever in is in Invercargill. And the old boys in the Borsal, well, I used to preach in there. 
And um, I'd given up smoking by that stage, but uh, I used to take cigarettes in with me because it's easy to get a crowd in a prison because no one wants to talk to you in those days. So I'd just break up the cigarettes pack until I had a heaps of cigarettes, just singles, and then I'd just hand them out one by one and share the gospel with the guy going, there you go, you can have a cigarette now. Yeah, it was great. It was great. And, and all the Baptist people I was with um, thought I was like the Antichrist because um, <laughs> I was promoting smoking and all that. No, so I'm not. I'm promoting Jesus. Yeah. Just smoking is just helping, all right? And uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's like either turn or burn, you know, like that's like, that kind of stuff. And uh, <laughs> I turn to someone and go, he's a lunatic. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so that impartation. So what was all about? That was about impartation. Yeah, you know, when you tell your testimony, it's impartation. When, you, when, a, when a young couple, you know, turn from what they've been doing and they decide to get married, and even though they've got kids and all that, they just say, no, we want to make this real. We want to stand before God and we, want to, we just don't want to have a casual relationship anymore because it was driving them apart. And uh, now they've done this and all their friends get invited. They share their testimonies. People get saved. That's impartation. The power of God is in your voice. That, that's why I say we're, sometimes we're aware that people have you know, hurt us or we don't like them or they, we don't get on with them, and whether it's in church or school or work or whatever those things are. But many times, and, and Proverbs says this, life and death is in the power of the tongue. And those who receive that, they eat the fruit of that. So, so you know, you can, I've heard parents prophesy disaster over their kids. Now, I've got, I've got a friend who's a And because uh, he should know better. He, you know, he reads theology and all that kind of thing. But he curses his children all the time. And his children are a mess. He's saying, oh, they should come back to God, but, you know, they're doing this and they're doing this. And, you know, you know one of them's going to die. And it's got, I'm going, stop it. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. What you speak over your kids, what you speak over your spouse, what you speak over your friends, what you speak is incredibly powerful. That's why prophecy is powerful. That's why and we'll be prophesying over people tonight, but, but that's why prophecy is, in, is so powerful because it begins to release um, a, a blueprint, if you like, for the presence of God to be in your life. It begins to bring encouragement. It's deep calls under deep. I, Christ in me calls to Christ in you. And, and it's just like it begins to bring healing and wholeness and, and, and save things. Come on, someone say hallelujah. I'm, like, I'm going to start speaking in other languages soon. It's like, it, because that's, that's so powerful. That's the impartation. So voice is imparted. Mary Thompson, when he, when he preached that day, even though I didn't know what he was talking about, I can't remember what he was talking about. Hand on heart, I cannot remember. I wish I could, but I can't. I was just a kid, wanted to go out for a smoke in the middle of his message. But the next morning I woke up and voice-activated prophecy, not that he prophesied, he was preaching, had, had, had called the, to the deep in me, called to the disasters in me, called to the addictions in me, and said, Ian, you've got to change. And, and I really had a manifestation of Jesus at, at that point. And uh, that was that thing. So we've got to guard our mouth. That's why James talks about, as we go, that, that our mouth or our tongue is like, an, like, a, um, like a rudder to a large ship. And so that can, we look at our, the track of our lives, often that's guarded by our, by our mouth, all right? And so let's be really careful about that. So let our lips praise him uh, and praise others. You know, I got little... I got, we got eight grandchildren, you know, five granddaughters. We had, we had three boys, and now I'm dealing with girls. Like, yeah. That's a whole nother level, like a whole nother level of multiple personalities right there. Like, that, right. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so I, but I've learned this. I just say to them, they come like, come like, Grandpa, and they cuddle up to me, and I say to them, and I whisper in the ear, and I go, you're my favourite. Don't tell the others. And, uh, and so they don't. Now they are. Now they're telling them. You know, like, I'm telling all that kind of stuff. What I'm doing, I'm saying, hey, you're, you're okay with me. You're okay with me. I'll let you do anything you like. You know, I'm getting told off. Dale tells me off. My daughter-in-law's tell me off. You're not allowed to give them that. And I said, listen, I'm grandpa. Those rules don't apply to me. I do not care <laughs> about your theology right now, <laughs> about raising children. Oh, yes. yeah. It is rebellion. It's rebellion. I, if, if I start breaking out the cigars, you'll know I'm in trouble. <laughs> so, 
So the, the, it's that whole thing. So voice activating. What are you saying over your grandchildren? What are you saying over your workmates? What are you saying over your spouse? All that. It's activation, all right? And so I, want to, I just want to uh, do that with you there. And then the laying on of hands is so incredibly important as well. And I, I don't want to sort of um, uh, overtake our time right now because I think um, it would be really nice to just lay hands on people this morning. Um, and, um, you know, just, just do that and get some of the leadership team up as well and the musos and do that. But the power of laying hands on people. Now, listen to this. Um, I, I, I love this. And this is out of Acts 19. I wonder if you guys can pull up Acts 19 for me uh, like you did before. That would be great. Um, and um, Acts 19, 1 to 6. I'm not quite sure of the version that I've got. Uh, the English version would be good. Uh, so, all right, that's cool. Acts 19, right, there we go. Uh, and I'm going to, yeah, let's go down to, I don't even have the verses in here. It's verse 1, verse 1, there's six verses. Um, and I'll just skim over the first two. Um, it happened when Apollos was in Corinth. Is that right? Yep, good. That Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That's always good you know, good to ask, and that uh, is there. And they said to him, we have not even heard about that there is a Holy Spirit. Just a bit of context there, that was 25 years after the Pentecost. All right? I, I, I did some cross-checking and, and, and different things, and, that, and, and I thought, oh, that's an interesting. So we've never even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. So that's 25 years after the most powerful encounter God has had uh, with the church since the giving of the Ten Commandments, all right? That was, that was amazing, out, out, all that stuff. And, uh, and so he said to them, uh, Apollos said to them, he said, uh, into then what were you baptized? And they said, oh, John's baptism. And Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying that people, saying to people they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And listen to it, watch this. And then when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. So God not only be able to, because when you speak in tongues, for example, and some of you may know this, I'm, I, I'm, I, man, I just love speaking in tongues. I, I, I do it all the time. Dale will testify to that. Um, both of us do that. But um, when you're speaking to God, you are building up yourself. You, the, the, Paul says this. He said, speaking in tongues edifies you. The word we get, edifice, comes from edifying. So when you speak in other tongues, out of you, it's not out of your brain. They've done MRI scans. Uh, they've done studies that your brain always, if, right now, because I'm speaking to you in a language that you understand, I hope, even though I'm from Southland. <laughs> I had elocution lessons, so you could. And um, what, what happens, the MRI shows the frontal lobe, which is where your speech center is, is glowing like, like it's a hot coal. So they see that on the MRI. The moment you speak in tongues, and they've done that, I've seen the MRI scans, the whole thing just dulls right down. Because you're not speaking out of your brain. You're speaking out of your spirit. You're speaking out of the innermost part of your life. And, and you're, speaking about, you're speaking out of Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so you're having this language. So it's not you know, necessarily ba 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 That's an outboard motor. All right? So, you, so if you're still stuck there, you, know, uh, you, you leave the boat and get the language. All right? That's just like, because many of us get stuck in the hall. It's like the water going down the sink, you know. It's like we need to get, it's a language. And you know, sometimes we just do it because we get so used to it. But I tell you what, when that does, it builds you. It builds, it edif builds the, it, it, the, 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 it edifies you. There's a building structure that's going on in you at all of that time. And so here they are. You know, they, they, they've missed Pentecost. Uh, and this is what begins to happen. It happens in churches, 25 years. And we've been, it's now been over well over 2,000 years since Pentecost. And, and the church now, in many cases, has forgotten all about this stuff. 
And I preach in different churches. I, I preach in Presbyterian churches. I speak in, in, in you know, in Baptist churches. I speak in Pres- Pentecostal churches. Um, you know, kind of all of those kind of things. So you get a different crowd. But I tell you, the, the, the amazing thing is that many of them have not heard the message of freedom. They've not heard that there's life and death in the power of the tongue. They've not had people lay hands on them in part. And why is impartation so incredibly powerful? Because Christ is in us. Christ is in us. So I become and you become a conduit for the Holy Spirit. And, and the flow of God just, just flows through. And I, I'm, all I'm doing is just releasing right now what I'm carrying, not through my mouth, but now through touch as well. So the laying on of hands is so incredibly important. And that's a fundamental uh, part of our Christian faith, yeah. the laying on of hands. Now, I know a lot of parents lay hands on children. You're not allowed to anymore, apparently. Um, but um, I've just been in Texas. Crikey, they, they haven't heard that message yet. I tell you, you know, the kids are naughty in church. They go outside to the woodshed. And, um, and uh, so it's like, anyway, it's, it's really hard preaching in New Zealand because they just don't get good humour. Um, <laughs> Humour me, and the and but 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 you know, laying on of hands is impartation. But if you lay hands on a child with anger, that's also impartation. Eh? Come on, yeah. So there's different ways that we can do that. You know, there's uh, you know, sexual molestation is impartation, and 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 but there's people in this room. I just know that. I know that there's people in this room simply because of the statistics. I, I'm an old statistician, so it was one of my things I did years and years ago for the hospitals. But I know that there are people in here that not only have been abused, but not only have been um, have been oppressed or, or 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 beaten up or been in all kinds of trauma and things like that. But the laying on of hands is so incredibly important. And um, and so, Father, right now in Jesus' name, Father, we take authority. And I take authority, Father, all over all of those memories that have now just been, um, been resurfaced. And, Father, I thank you that you're a God whom, who sets free. Who sets free. In Jesus' name, you've broken down the chains. You've taken off the chains. You've opened prison doors. You've set captives free. Lord, sometimes it takes an earthquake to shake the chains off then, Lord, we thank you for that young man who had an earthquake experience in Cuba Mall just recently. And, Lord, you showed him randomly, just showed him this out of the billions of people on earth, you showed this young man how much you loved him. And it was a turnaround moment for him. You imparted to him. And, Lord, I pray for every person in this room right now. I just want you to lift your hands where you're at, all right? And we, we just, I wonder if the musicians would just come. I'm going to need you. Um, just as we close off in a few moments. But Father, in Jesus' name, as we lift our hands together, as we lift our hands together, we become aware of you. We become aware of the impartation of your presence. We become aware right now of fresh oil coming on us. What would that even feel like? Someone's pouring some olive oil over you right now, over your head. I mean, I feel it because I'm bald, but um, you know, maybe it takes a few moments because you've got hair, but uh, it'll, it'll, nonetheless, it'll come. It'll make itself felt in the presence of God. Maybe someone you, you, you know, would, would lay hands on you. I'll choose Philippa again, but in the name of Jesus right now, I release right now the presence of Almighty God. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That waves and waves. And I see right now, as even as I said waves, Philippa, that you know the tide has turned in such a remarkable way and is coming in. And uh, it is, uh, I see it just covering all the dips and hollows uh, that are exposed at, at low tide. And uh, there's such a he- waves of healing coming in in Jesus' name. <clears throat> but this is, a, this is a tide that will not necessarily recede. Yes, it does in the natural, but a supernatural tide has come in and there's a fresh flow through your family, through your family, through your family, through your siblings, through your parents, in Jesus' name. And I speak that in Jesus' name. There is a flow throughout New Zealand right now, a wave of your glory. Even an Australian prophetic voice 
uh, just said a couple of weeks ago, or less than that, 10 days ago probably now, um, that he saw a giant wave uh, moving across the land. And so, Father, we just say thank you right now that you are bringing the tide into many of our lives. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord.